a perpetual rehearsal of the thing you're experiencing. But the minute you focus your attention on something else, it goes. They had a piano player whose area of the brain here had been ablated. Now this man could remember his total past, as to say he could remember his entire musical repertoire, but he could not learn any new pieces. And furthermore, when he gave a concert and they would tell him what piece to start with, he would start with that piece because he knew it. But the minute he finished and bowed and went off stage, when he came back out, he thought it was the beginning of the concert and he wanted to play the same piece over. And they would just have, they had to tell him, well, the audience has decided doesn't want to hear the first piece. So you have to start with the second piece because he'd already played the first piece, but he couldn't remember it. And they tried to get him to go through the whole concert that way until finally they just say, start with the last piece. And which made him very uncomfortable. He had to give it up. It was too much strain on him. Because he thought, well, how can you, get, how can you play only the last piece and, uh, and uh, get your money's worth? And of course, it's very tricky because the time passes and it's always a surprise that it's as late as it is, because previous moments have not uh, been rehearsed. There was another uh, person that had the same, uh, had lesions in the same area, and Brenda Milner, who's one of the researchers there, was doing research on him, and um, she'd given him a group of numbers, four, five, six, to remember, and she left him in the room and went out and came back fully expecting that he would have forgotten it because she left several seconds or a minute or two go by. When she came back and said, what are the numbers? He said, four, five, six, and she was astounded. And she found out that he had said four, five, six out loud so that it had come out and gone in his ear, which enabled short-term memory to hear it again. And before it faded, he said four, five, six out loud again, which went into his ear got the nerve endings going, and before it faded, he said four, five, six again. So by just saying four, five, six, four, five, six, four, five, six, he could remember four, five, six indefinitely. And he was still doing it after he had said it to her. He said four, five, six. He went on inside his head, probably subvocally, saying four, five, six. And then she reports that a truck had gone by and backfired, and they both went to the window to look out. And then she turned to him and said, uh, what's the number? He said, what number? Because the distraction now made it impossible for him to re rehearse the sequence. So there is some anatomical evidence now in the brain for a short memory term function. And there's a lot of research going on about this. And I suspect things will change uh, as well. Um, we also know that in short term memory, Time is the thing that's the enemy of storage in short-term memory. The minute a certain amount of time goes by, it's gone. Whereas long-term memory, the enemy of it usually turns out to be associative interference factors. And um, when Chuck said that he thought of his junk drawer, if, he, if you're not careful with that, pretty soon you've got associative interference going on because now he will begin to imagine things in his junk drawer out on the table and now he won't know which is which. And this is called associative interference or another kind of interference. Um, it's called the inhibition or interference and um, you can have two types, either proactive or retroactive inhibition or inter interference. Proactive inhibition or interference is when what you are learning now is being interfered with by what you already know. That's when information coming in doesn't match very well with what you've got, and so it's scrambling what you've got. Retroactive inhibition means that what you are learning now is scrambling and interfering with what you've already got stored. And um, it's kind of a two-way street there. That's why if teachers really know what's stored in their children's heads, 
they can proceed in a way that minimizes the possibility of these kinds of inhibitions. Um, I did an experiment once without knowing all of this. It was just a hunch I had. It's when I was in the army and there were a lot of children of GIs and um, who wanted their children to have piano lessons. And um, I was just beginning to think about some of the basic Anisa ideas and I was getting ready to shift my whole career away from a concert artist to behavioral scientist. And um, I was very interested in what happens to children who take piano lessons. Because as soon as they ha leave the place where they have the lesson and go home, they start rehearsing errors. Now, those errors get stored in memory. And it is very difficult, well, it's impossible, to deliberately forget something. The most you can do is remember the right way and store it, and it usually gets stored right along with the wrong way, and now you have to add to it, this is wrong and this is right. Now you'll have a lot of words like that. I have one like a cross. I can never remember whether it's got two C's or one. And uh, you probably have a lot of... Some children who've learned with the look -say method will have millions of these problems because they're looking not at distinctive attributes of the letter that make up the word, but they're looking at such things as word shape, which is not, does not differentiate enough the letters and therefore they don't have a good sense of spelling. Look say method of reading always produces on the average a whole lot of uh, very poor spellers for that reason. Now I want to just talk very briefly about uh, some elements that facilitate memory in addition to those that I've already mentioned. Incidentally, there will be types of memory associated with the basic categories of potentialities as itemized by the ANISA model. There will be biological memory and this functions in terms of the genetic code. It functions the whole immune system of the body functions in this way. You know, when you, get a, when you get a vaccination for smallpox and they put this stuff in you, the, there are biological creatures that grab that little bit of disease that you put in and they take a complete reading on its profile. They make, in effect, a kind of key and lock imprint and then they jam the lock. And this is why when the real disease comes, it doesn't have a chance. Because the body has already stored in biological memory a profile of that disease. Now, it's interesting. Memory fails a little bit after time. And that's when you need, that's why you need re-inoculation. But there is a function, an extraordinary function of what I'm calling biological memory that goes along with that category of potentiality. Then there will be five types of other memory. There will be psychomotor memory, which you have, you can recall what it feels like to do a dive. This is precisely why a diver can perform a swan dive each time, and it won't look like some other kind of dive, because there is recorded in the motor cortex a sequenced pattern of which muscles and which cells have to contract at what time, in what sequence, at what speed, in order to produce that dive. You would not get a Nadia coma each if you did not have a psychomotor memory. There's a perceptual memory. I can ask you, do you remember what onions taste like? Do you remember what an onion looks like? Do you remember what an onion feels like? And you will be able to recall memory from those modalities which will define for you a pretty good stored symbolic notion of what an onion is. So there will be psychomotor, perceptual, cognitive, affective, and volitional types of memories. We, ha <clears throat> we have yet to work out a detailed system for facilitating memory <clears throat> in all of these areas. That's something we're working on now. What we tend to remember, though, are very large 
patterned uses of energy that reflect an expression of all of those modalities. And these patterned uses of energy we call values. And it is knowing how you use your energy in these patterned forms that creates your identity. And you remember who you are to the extent that you remember those total patterned uses of energy. And that's how somebody else knows you pretty much too. They might know what you look like, but to really know a person is to know how they use their energies. So that old question, know thyself, which you could add to it, remember thyself, means knowing how you use your energies. And this is stored in some total way and lets you realize who you are. And you can predict for yourself then how you might behave in unusual circumstances or in similar circumstances because you know what you do. And uh, without knowing that, you would never be able to alter a habit because you wouldn't even remember what it was you were trying to alter. Nonetheless, the sort of imminence I'm talking about now, the total organized memory of how you use your energies is very difficult to alter because when you alter it, your identity changes, your personality changes. And some very intense experiences like deaths or severe disappointments or traumas tend to scramble things and you get new patterns after that. Now keep in mind also something else, namely our definition of learning, which is the ability to differentiate, integrate, and generalize experience, is highly associated with the basic means of facilitating storage. I just mentioned to you a moment ago that I cannot see all of you at once, so I must extract certain things. That extraction is a form of differentiation. What happens, though, when I have an experience in school and I extract what is irrelevant? It means that is all that gets stored. A way you can make something have distinction is to associate with it an emotional reaction or increase involvement. And incidentally, moving the large muscles associated with anything you want the child to learn abstractly facilitates memory for that thing. So if you got up to the child who couldn't remember three times four is twelve and said three times four is twelve and made him do it three times, he would not forget what three times four is twelve. He would remember that forever. However, if you went through the entire multiplication tables with physical movements, now the psychomotor burden, the, mer the burden on psychomotor memory is so great that it begins to interfere. But you see, three times four is 12, and even you yourself now, because it's known that when you see somebody moving their muscles, you yourself have impulses going to the same muscles I was moving, will have facilitated your remembering this experience on this occasion more than some others. This, uh, this is why dance is a very powerful art medium, because when you see those bodies moving, you tend to get a sympathetic response. And it's not enough to cause you to move your own muscles necessarily, but you're still getting the impulses. Now, if you watch a boxing match, if you've seen people watching a boxing match, they're going like this, you know, sitting there. Or if it's a particularly crucial football play, you watch the people who are watching television, they're out there passing the ball and so on. Or if you're driving with a reckless driver, you'll find that you're putting the brake on uh, in the, on the right-hand side of the car because you're having a sympathetic reaction to all of these things. So feature extraction, which is differentiation, is very important. This is why learning competence, which is the conscious ability to make the extraction, and which we define as a part of learning competence, obviously has this very direct association with memory. Now, integration means associating or matching what, what's happening or what's coming in with other things that are coming in and matching that and integrating it with something that's already there. Integration creates meaning. 
integration creates pattern. And things that are patterned are more easily remembered. No pattern means random. random. Randomness means no meaning. No meaning means no storage. However, you can remember that the experience you had was meaningless, even though you can't remember the experience itself. In other words, you can read a book that is beyond you, and you can remember that this book was terrible, in the sense that you couldn't understand it. But you cannot remember what it was you couldn't understood, what you couldn't understand. <laughs> It slipped over into the past tense somewhere back there. <laughs> then there is a kind of rehearsal that consolidates memory that comes in the form of generalization. And this is something you can help your children. Um, you can improve their memories by providing the experience which enables them to generalize what they have learned. And this generalization simply means um, it's not repetition. It is, in fact, repetition with variation. In other words, they are taking this experience here, and you move it over here to a similar but slightly different circumstance, and it will consolidate the memory of, of the essentials of that experience. Well, one, just five or six other quick points. When you store something, put an address on it and then you'll be able to find it. And there are, the best way to do that is that the address should be something that you can easily get access to in your own head because you often go there. And um, the, the, the instance of that here would be when you uh, categorized a system and say, I'm going to put all metal objects here. Metal object now puts an address on that item. Let me just list them all. Rehearsal and repetition helps subjective organization. Chunking is another word for ordering something. And it's very hard to remember more than seven items that are unrelated. So you should, if you're giving new material to a kid, don't go over seven. If he's slow for some other reason, don't go over two or three. You consolidate memory if you review what you've just done sooner as opposed to later. In other words, if you do something once and you wait 12 hours, the returns on that won't be so good as if you just wait one hour and do it again. Of course, you should do it 12 hours later too, but the 12, <coughs> the, 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 for the time invested, you're going to be better if you do it closer, sooner, as opposed to later. Attentional functions are important determinants of memory. Every time you have a distraction, memory is impaired. Novelty is important because it increases arousal, and people tend to pay attention to something that's new. However, if it's brand totally new, then there's nothing to connect with, and so you lose meaning. That's why you only want a little bit of novelty. Being fatigued impairs memory, so you need to be fresh. I've already said if you move muscles, which is one form of involvement, you're going to get better storage. And finally, if you can use advanced organizers when you're presenting abstract material, cognitive material, by creating in children anchoring ideas, which are anchoring points you know they already have in their heads, then you aren't leaving it up to them to find the anchoring idea. You actually fish it out for them. And this would be particularly important for children who are having disabilities and difficulties. You need to make sure the anchoring point is there. And before you start doing something, find the anchoring point. And you'll find this kid will then hook it onto that and be able to retrieve it more actively. Yes? Could you please give an example of that? Sure. <clears throat> Supposing. Uh, you know that the child likes something. For instance, he has a passion for chocolate ice cream. And you're going to talk about something now. And um, you can anchor it. I mean, this is just a, an absurd idea, but it'll still work. You anchor what it is he's learning to chocolate ice cream. And he'll retrieve it more, more readily. An anchoring idea is in a form of an address. 
So he can fi he he files it. Now, of course, if you anchor too much to chocolate ice cream, then it'll be too complicated. You see. And uh, but once you get to know a child well, you know what he retrieves most easily, and that will tell you what anchoring points are there. And most people have vast possibilities of anchoring things. There are the these little devices are called mnemonic devices. M N E O N M I C. Mnemonic. And they all refer to ways of connecting with something in your mind or creating an ordering scheme. For instance, if I uh, if I give you that nonsense sequence of letters, and I said uh, in two weeks I want you to remember this and erased it now, it would be a very low pro probability if I came back in two weeks that you would know what it is. However, if I told you that it's frown spelled backwards, in two weeks you would all remember. Especially if I said, everybody frown now. Because that's moving the muscles directly associated with the word, word. It gets stored in two weeks. If I came and asked you, would you remember what word I put on the board? You would all say frown. And it would be quite effortless. However, if I left it like that, chances are there wouldn't be anybody who remembered it in two weeks. Now, my point is, for lots of children, 60% of the day is like this. So you now know why so little is retained. Because it doesn't get anchored to anything. Because we haven't built the anchoring point and drawn it out and connected stuff to it. We've missed that, missed that out. Now, have you got uh, 60 seconds? Because I want you to take a fresh piece of paper and write down the list of things you had out there. I don't want to compare what you did first with what you did second. You have three minutes. <laughs> How many got 26? One. How many got 25? Four. 24. 23. 22. 21. 20. 19. 18. 17. So on. <laughs> well, there are two things operating here. There's a fight between decay, because time has lapsed, a lot of information has come in. But, so that will cause a decrease in memory. But, we rehearsed this list right after you had done it. Because I put all the names on the board, you had to look at your list a whole lot of times. And therefore, that will boost the possibility of memory. Incidentally, that's something you might want to keep in mind in the way you teach reading. If you teach a short reading lesson and repeat it three times in a day, you will have more recall on the average than one big lesson, which doesn't get repeated until the next day or two days later. Actually, the way in the Anisa system ultimately reading would be taught is that you would have some formal part of the day where uh, some part of the day where reading is formally addressed but that there will be a subsequent review of that lesson shortly afterwards, not taking the same amount of time, but much, much less. And then everybody else in the system who knows what that reading lesson is now emphasizes those same points. In fact, learning these, the symbol systems of math, the arts, and reading, language, are so important in Lisa because they are main vehicles of the organization and enrichment of eminence. And that means, excuse me, you have more equipment to bear on the present, which means you have a better future. Well, that's all it for, that's it for today. Laura has an announcement, and then you can go. Okay. You're welcome. Now, what was it I was going to say? Oh, yeah. Three quick things. Uh, number one, the issues that you wrote out when you pass them, this side of the room, please. 